My sermon this morning is about as basic as I know how to make it. As I say often, and it's coincidental, didn't know John, uh, Jonathan would be singing that last song. But you'll notice that the emphasis of that song is they all shall sweetly obey thy will. Of course, it has to do with the storm on the sea that the Lord quieted by saying, Peace, be still. And thus, I want to emphasize that while the Bible is a unique book because it is God's Word, no other way you're going to learn how to be saved or how God wants you to live in this life if you don't know that Bible properly. One of the ways that it's unique, being the will of God, expressed in words on your level of understanding and mind, is that it demands certain things. You think for a moment when there's that great storm out on the Sea of Galilee, and the great creator of all things just simply by his word said, Peace, be still. And it all settled immediately. And the emphasis is given in the song that God's will is going to be done over everything. It doesn't make any difference what, whether it's evil spirits or men or whatever they be. But I want to emphasize this morning that the Bible is a very demanding book. It's saying you must do this, or in some cases you must not do that. It is a book of authority, Colossians 3.17, we do only what's authorized. What's authorized is what the words mean as you study them in their proper context. So it has a right because it's God's word to demand certain things. If you just take the Bible as a book of suggestions or wise sayings that you can take or not take, or if it's not really a book from God, it truly is one of the most impertinent books on the face of the earth if it is not God's infallible inspired word. But I want us to examine it today. Likely most of you will be nothing new in this, except it emphasizes that it is God's word and it demands. It demands of us. And if you want to see how that is, then just go to what it teaches about the judgment and standing before the judgment bar of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Of course, the Bible will mean then and say then what it means now and says now. And the authority of Christ is manifested in the New Testament of Christ, Matthew 28, 18. And we're to do all things by his authority. It's, it's difficult for me, and I has been all my life, to understand how so many people can call Christ Lord. He's my Savior. He's the only Savior. and Sweet, sweet Jesus and all this kind of thing. And yet they have no problem violating what he demands. And yet there's the plain question the Lord put to challenge the minds of men. Why call you me? Lord, Lord, all that implies, in other words, and do not the things which I say. So I want to emphasize that the Bible is a most demanding book, and we ought to approach it in that way. It doesn't mean it's not a book that declares the love of God, but in declaring the love of God, it declares the way of salvation. It makes it clear there's but one way. We used to sing a song. I don't know where it is now. There's just one way to the pearly gate. Well, that's right. You can't find many, many ways taught in the Bible to reach heaven. Now, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end there are for the ways of death. But there's the Lord's way or, or no way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. 
First of all, let me emphasize beyond those introductory remarks that the Bible is a book that demands to be read. In the infinite wisdom of Almighty God, who could have done things in various ways, he chose to make man as we are and for man to come to the understanding of anything as we do. And he chose, therefore, to give us his way of life through words that he knows we can study and understand and learn. It would be ridiculous for people to say, well, yes, that's the very word of God, but who can understand it? And there are some people who almost take that view. I've heard all my life people saying, well, that's just your interpretation. Well, what does that mean? God, you're saying God had a problem of expressing his will to us in words or on our own level of understanding. God had a problem of saying, if you want to know my will, study my word, for I put my will in my word. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful, meaning alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Think about that for a moment. Thus, when you look at James 1.25, whosoever continueth in the perfect law of liberty, whosoever looketh into it and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Well, that's the demand the Bible makes of us. And couple that with Hebrews 4.12 and other verses like that. And it's obvious you're not going to know how to go to heaven. You're not going to know about sin and its consequences and the need of a Savior if you're oblivious to the teaching of God's good word. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good works. Again, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Jesus said to the Jews of his day concerning the Old Testament scriptures, these are they which bear witness of me, John 5, 39. In other words, you read through the Old Testament, you have all kinds of prophecies that the Jews were expected to know whereby they could identify the Messiah when he came. So that the Bible is a message of life is evident from another very common scripture of Paul's writing to the church at Rome in the beginning of the book, Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now watch it. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Now if you don't know the word of God properly, you don't know God's power to save. Thus we've long said where the word of God and its purity has not gone, then there are no Christians. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. There's no way I can increase my faith, my belief, my confidence, my trust in God Christ and the Christian system as presented in the Bible and my confidence in the Bible as the very word of God. There's no way that can happen. If I don't know the book. And that means effort on my part. That means learning how to study it. Learning how it authorizes. That takes time. Notice what he said in John 6, 63. The words I have spoken unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are life. What? The words Jesus had spoken to the apostles in that case. Well, if you're going to know the life that God offers, the spiritual life that he offers to mankind, you'll have to know the word of God. If you're going to know what it is to be spiritual before God, to live your life on a spiritual plane, you must know the word of God. And God demands that of us in the study of the scriptures. But of course, the, the power of God's word is not just found because it's here. It is meant to be studied, understood, 
taken in the heart and lived out in our lives. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 3, 3 through 4. Part of that reading is, I wrote a four in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand. Now think about that. Whereby when you read, you may understand. Did God not know what he was talking about? Whereby when you read, you may understand. No reading, what? No understanding. This is really the purpose of the word of God. Being written that we may read and understand it. God comments through the inspired Luke as he tells about things concerning the work of Paul in spreading the gospel. And he commends the Bereans in that they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily whether these things were so. Acts 15, 11. Now there's something important to note there. Several things. But one of them is there was a readiness to receive the word preached. A readiness. They were ready to hear. They were ready to learn. They were ready to obey. They were ready to do whatsoever God enjoined upon them. And that was through the word that he did so. It's expected that the Bible be read both publicly and privately. And concerning the reading of the Bible publicly in the assembly of God's people, the inspired apostle Paul said, when this epistle is read among you, watch it, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, Colossians 4.16. Something you may or may not know concerning the old 1611 King James Version is that when those translators were working on that version, of course, for their day and time, they were doing their best to be true to the original Hebrew and what little Aramaic is there in translating the Old Testament and to the original Koine Greek of the New in rendering it into English. They were concerned about that. Uh, there wouldn't have been an interest in translating it from the original tongues into English if that was an important matter. But one thing that they did, as each committee assigned certain passages of the Bible to translate, and then they would work it through that committee, and then they would come together and they would read it out loud to one another. Well, why would they do that? They wanted it to flow as it was read out loud to a congregation. I've said for years and years, especially when I was in preacher training school, stand up somewhere, nobody's going to bother you, and read the scriptures out loud. You got to remember that Paul dictated these things. And they will read just like a good sermon. And some things you can understand better if you will read them like it's being preached because you catch the flow of it. Now, that means you can't run over commas and semicolons and colons and run sentences together and so forth. I would urge this on everybody who stands up before anybody to preach. If you're going to use a manuscript and read from it, try to get to where you don't sound like you're reading from a manuscript. <laughs> Learn how to present it in a way that it's natural and it flows. The translators of the King James Version did that when they were trying to put together the flow of the English once they had got it into whatever it was needed to say in the Greek. So we have study to show thyself approved unto God, a word with that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, or as American standard says, handling aright the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. There's no substitute for that, folks. 
You know, we talk about a lot of the modern day conveniences and helps and the technology that's there. You have a problem reading, a lot of folks nowadays they don't read too well because they don't read. Some people will tell you, I don't like reading. I know you read something. <laughs> and if you're going to learn to read anything, wouldn't it be the Bible? But there's so many helps. You can turn on your computer. You can go online. You can find places where there are the scriptures and somebody that's a very good reader. One of them, Alexander Scorby, who did this record, record way back in the early 50s, reads, and I think one of the best, reads right along. And you can read right along with them. And you don't think that won't help you? Why to help immensely? When you know you have a weakness, work on it. <laughs> of course, you've got to be honest with yourself and admit you have one. If you don't admit you have one, I don't know how you're growing anything. So the Bible demands that it be read and read in such a way we can understand it for our own good. If you're not reading it for your own good, you're not out to help anybody else. So read it for your own good to be enlightened in God's way for your life. It also demands to be believed. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Now just reading it like you would some sort of recipe or something uh, or some kind of book or the newspaper or whatever is, is not going to get it. You have to understand the book it's as old as it is, and even rendered into English, you have to look up meanings of words. Simply to read this book is never going to fulfill the demands that it makes on every one of us. We must believe it to be from God for the reason that it was given. Listen to how the Apostle Paul thanked God for the Thessalonian Christians. He says, because, here's what he said, when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. This book, of course, makes for itself the claim for inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We just noticed that in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture given of inspiration of God. And Peter writes in no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. In other words, men were not allowed to put their own things so in it as the Holy Spirit gave them the mind of God and overruled their human error to produce the infallible book. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter 1, 20, 21. The Greek word there, move, means born along. They were not guiding it themselves. The Holy Spirit just took them and led them where he wanted them to go without any influence of their own will. It was God's will being given to the earth. But not only must we believe that book to be from God we must believe actually what it says sometimes people think they know what it says and they're really trying to know and they're just caught up in human doctrine and that's influencing them so much they miss it but then there are those people who read it and understand it and they just don't believe it <laughs> Jesus said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15, 16. And in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse number 6, the inspired writer said, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And of course, we've already noticed several times today and many times the teaching of Paul in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing the word of God. We may know what it says, but do we believe it? 
If you read about the children of Israel in their wilderness wandering, the writer of Hebrews says of them, uh, they understood as far as what was happening, but they didn't believe it. It's not mixed with faith in them that heard it. I'm convinced there are many people that sit under good preaching or good Bible classes. They hear and their education such is that they understand, but they don't see that God's demanding anything out of them. They may be thinking, boy, he really got the fellow next to me, but never making a personal application of the truth that's revealed in the scriptures. So it not only is a demanding book in that it demands to be read, and it demands to be believed, but that's not the end of it. It also demands that it be obeyed. Ye shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. You read further in the scriptures, Peter writing to Christians in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. So this book demands faith and obedience. You'll remember that Paul writing in the church at Philippi commended the Philippians saying, you have always obeyed. Isn't that an amazing thing? Philippians 2.12. You've always obeyed. I'd like to know those people. Some point down the line, evidently, later on, some didn't. But the time Paul wrote that letter, that's what he said. Peter refers to Christians as children of obedience. 1 Peter 1, verse 14. Jesus taught the necessity of obedience. When he said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And yet people sit around us all the time. Praising God with their lips and doing whatever to claim they love God. And they're his dear servants and Jesus means more to them than anything else. But they don't do what he said in the way he said it. And for the reason, sometimes there's more reasons that he said do whatever it is that he said. He asked in Luke 6, 46, what I mentioned earlier, why I call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. So automatically from these simple passages, and I know everyone here understands them, they get the message, the lessons clear from them. Do we read in the book that Jesus is the author of salvation? to those that hear, to those that believe, or it is this, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 89. The demands of obedience that the book, the Bible makes are very graphically shown in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Surely we see the Bible demands that it be obeyed. Demands to be read, it demands it be believed, and it demands that it be obeyed. It also demands that we reject teachings that contradict the Bible, that are contrary to it. We would simply say false teaching. You'll remember in Exodus 20 and verse 5, that God declared, I the, Lord, thy, I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. In other words, I'll have no other gods before me. This is shown in the book he's given us. 
clearly from Genesis to the book of Revelation, everywhere in between. It will permit no substitutes for it. It allows no changes to it. There are no companion volumes to it. Paul wrote that he was set for the defense of the gospel, Philippians 1.16. And Jude commands all of us who are faithful members of the church to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints, verse 3. And we read, as the word grants all things that pertain to life and godliness, Second Peter 1, 3. You're not going to find outside the confines of the Bible anything that you need in order to live godly and go to heaven that's not already in the Bible. That's the purpose of it, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It thoroughly furnishes us, or in modern day terms, thoroughly furnishes us unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 17. <coughs> Nothing else is needed if we could just sell that to people. They'll proclaim, oh, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. But then when you begin to study it, then they begin to back up. And we must be careful about that. The only reason the church that Jesus built continues to exist on this earth is that there are people who are humble and honest enough that they will take the word of God and only the word of God rightly divided and obey the gospel and live in harmony with what it authorizes. Anytime we want to change, just quit studying the Bible. And it will be said of us, as it was said of Israel of old, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You'll remember that Israel was warned not to add to or diminish aught from God's word. Well, we're taught the same thing today. In Galatians 1, 6 through 8, there were some in that day and time who were teaching false doctrine. And he said, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed, literally cut off from God. That's serious business. That's why God thinks of false teachers. That's the reason we better be careful what we teach, lest we're cut off from God. We're under the curse of this. John warned, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Second John 9, you say, well, I have God. God's on my side. And when you know you're not doing what he said, he's not on your side. You don't have him. He's made it clear. If I'm on your side, it's because you love me and keep my commandments. If you don't love me and keep my commandments, it make a difference what you say. I'm not on your side. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. So this book's going to judge us. Not only must read it, we not only must believe it, we not only must obey it, we not only must reject teachings that's contrary to it, but we have in our hands that book that will judge us all on the last day. Now, Jesus has taught us plainly that heaven and earth shall pass away, my words won't, Matthew chapter 24, 35. And then I quoted earlier at the beginning of the lesson as we draw to a close. is a good way to end. And you'll notice, I hope, all of you, you, you all know all these passages. How many times, let me ask you this, have you heard them preached and have you read them? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. Now, would you say this book is not a demanding book? Or would you say this book demands of us that it be read, obeyed, which implies understanding, that it be defended while we reject all of the teachings and live by it with anticipation of the judgment? 
I sometimes hear people say, well, I just, I can't stand to respond to the invitation to obey the gospel. All those people looking on are, I, I just can't walk to the front when it's a public sin that needs to be confessed with all those people, confessed that's all those people there. Well, if you've got a problem with that, try standing before the judgment bar of God all by yourself. Well, you will infallibly recall everything you ever thought, said, and did and give an account to Jesus Christ according to the truth of the New Testament. How do you think you're going to feel then? Well, I suggest to you, if you don't have the courage to do what God requires of you here and now, something is sadly wrong and needs to be corrected, and you're the only one that can do it. There's a burden each one of us bears that nobody else can discharge for us, and that's our personal responsibility to God to obey his will and do his bidding. It's rather personal if we let it, if we're just going to listen to other people or cruise around the edges. We're not helping ourselves. So next time you pick up this book, look at it and say, Holy Bible, a most demanding book. After all, it's God's word, and he has a right to demand of his creatures what he does. If you're not a child of God this morning, it's an excellent opportunity to come one because it's all you have. Today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Believe in Christ with all your heart. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him. And be buried with your Lord in baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Lord, adding you to the church. Your sins remitted. And in the church, be faithful to him. If as a child of God you've committed sin, we urge you to humble yourself before him, repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Are you ready to meet your maker? Would you have that in your mind while together we stand and sing?